All right, just another quick video answering a Calvinistic proof text they'll use to teach their Gnostic heresy of total inability and total depravity. Now, this is not the same thing as having a sinful flesh or original sin. And by the way, I'm not a Pelagian. I've clarified this in other videos. Any Calvinist who still accuses me of being a semi-Pelagian, as I've been accused of, you're lying. You're falsely accusing, which is very typical of Calvinists, by the way, too. They're very prideful, contentious individuals. Um, sinful flesh is not total depravity. They redefine original sin to fit their doctrine via eisegesis. In fact, Calvinism is just based on eisegesis. They read their own theology into the text. And one such scripture uh, that teaches sinful flesh and teaches a sinful nature, but they will twist to teach a total inability and total depravity, is Romans chapter 3, verse 10, 11, verses uh, 10 to 12. Okay, let's take a look at what the passage is saying. You're going to see how they're just totally inserting total inability into the text. They're totally inserting it. They're totally inserting total inability. That's how I'll say it. Romans 3, verse 10, 11, and 12. And you're going to see they're taking this out of context too, by the way. Romans 3, 10, 11, and 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay? Now, they take this as proof of total inability to do good. Now, if that was the case, it would directly contradict Romans 2, verse 14 to 15, which says that the Gentiles, by nature, do that which is contained in the law. Also, Romans uh, 1, verse 26, 27 talks about how, basically, the, the uh, homosexuality, it's against nature. They do that which is against nature. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5, you know, without natural affection. Okay? Uh, total inability is not the same thing as sinful flesh. Now, what they do is, again, they won't read the context, okay? In context, this is not saying total inability to do anything good. Now, what this is teaching is, because when they say there's none that do with good, they redefine that as you can never do anything other than sin, okay? Uh, is that what the text is saying? Can a lost person do good? Now, in the context of salvation, that's what this text is talking about. Why? You know, what saith the scriptures? Romans 3, 9, okay? The verse before verse 10, see they cherry pick the verse. They cherry pick these three verses, um, Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Okay? You can do no good in the context of salvation. Nothing you do can earn your salvation. That's what it says when it says there's that none that doeth good. You, you know, he can do no good as, some, as you could put it. Uh, this is talking about salvation. You can do no good. You cannot earn your salvation by what you do. Okay, that's the full. Uh, that's what the whole passage is really talking about. And by the way, the context of Romans three is chapters one down to verse chapter eight. So another example of how they rip that out of context. Okay, can a lost person do good in the context of avoiding a sinful act? Absolutely. Again, Romans two verse fourteen and fifteen. They do the Gentiles do that which is by nature contained in the law. Uh, Genesis 20, verse 1 to 9, contains an example of this. The pagan king of Bimelech knows that adultery is wrong, even though he's a lost pagan king. You know, Romans 1, verse 18 down to verse 25, shows how it's completely abnormal and unnatural to believe in atheism, like I once did. You know, uh, my testimony, I'm a former atheist. So, you know, can they do good in the sense of avoiding sin? Absolutely. Can they do good? In terms of it meriting salvation, absolutely not. There's none that doeth good. That's what the text is talking about. But you see, they read total inability into that verse. They just they insert all these fallacious false doctrines to, to prove their Gnostic heresy. So, you know, read the context. Romans 3 9 is is showing us what this is about. So anyway, just another good video, uh, you know, sorry, another video refuting a lot of the common Calvinistic proof text. Because as a babe in Christ, you can easily get swayed. Because out of context, they, very, they seem very, very Calvinistic. That's why you got to look at the totality of Scripture. They'll profess sola scriptura all day long. You know, they, they profess sola scriptura, but in works, they, they uh, deny it. Plain and simple. So anyway, don't be deceived by Calvinism and their Gnostic twisting of the Scriptures to, to prove their, their uh, heresies. It's all eisegesis. They redefine terms. They insert their, their own theology. They have this pre-commitment to TULIP that forces them to reinterpret Scripture with their preferred definition. Hence, while you quote scriptures like Romans 2, uh, 14 to 15, Romans 1, verse uh, 18 down to verse 27, you know, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5, they will not address it. They'll just overlook it or ignore it. I've done that with Calvinists because they cannot contend beyond what they probably have heard from John Piper or John MacArthur or James White or any of these, these other Calvinist popes that have been exalted as they essentially gods of philosophy. So I could say a whole lot more on that. 
Uh, I'm not going to do that. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.